it's not just a collection of neat folk songs. Betty is Rebecca Harkness. Taylor's album letter. What is Taylor Swift's album folklore really about? There's a secret theme that ties together every single song, and absolutely no one is talking about it so far that I could find. And why did she write the album this way? With fiction and with secrets. I'm Amanda, I'm a folklore theorist. You might recognize me from TikTok, and if you do, my condolences. This album is my favorite topic. I think things about this album that no one else seems to be talking about. If you like this album as much as I do, I can't wait to share this story with you. So let's take a few minutes to chat about the basics of my theory, setting a framework of what we can expect from this album. What is folklore really about? It's not just a collection of neat folk songs. This is a concept album, meaning that all of the tracks tie together and should be perceived together. They have deeper meaning when you listen to them all together rather than just as individual tracks. And the common theme? Rebecca Harkness. That's right, the whole album is about Rebecca Harkness, not just The Last Great American Dynasty. And I know what you're thinking, you're in the comments right now, like, the entire album is about Taylor, Invisible Spring is about Taylor, Epiphany is about her grandfather, stop taking that away from her. That's the trick. It's also about Taylor. In my opinion, it seems like Taylor Swift learned a lot more about Rebecca Harkness sometime after she moved into her Rhode Island home in 2013. From my research and reading this book, I strongly believe that Taylor Swift read Rebecca Harkness' biography written by Craig Unger. It's called Blue Blood. In it, she saw parallel, after parallel, after parallel, from her own life to Rebecca Harkness' life. She went from thinking that they were similar people to thinking they were the same. She began to wonder if she was living out a series of canon events, if you will. That's how similar their lives were. Or she may even believe that she is Rebecca Harkness reincarnated. Unclear, ask Taylor, I don't know. Or likely she probably just wrote from that hypothetical creative perspective. But either way, she saw strong connections from herself to Rebecca Harkness' life. So she wrote about those connections. Each song on folklore represents two simultaneous truths. One piece of the story can be applied to Taylor Swift and the things that she relates to. The other piece of the story tells something about Rebecca Harkness or talks about the feelings of someone who was significant in her life, one of the characters who helped to shape her. Someone who had an impact on her development and her personality. But I thought I finally had this cool theory worked out where the entire album's about Betty James and Augustine. Friend, that's the big shocker. Betty is Rebecca Harkness. The events described about Betty are loosely based on true stories that were told about Rebecca Harkness' real life. They're partly true and they're partly imagined, and we'll talk about why later. But the connections between Betty and Rebecca are unreal. And yes, Rebecca went by the name Betty growing up. All right, why is it imagined? Okay. Reason number one, some of the events of Betty's life match Rebecca Harkness, and some of them don't. There is no founding to suggest that it's based on a story about Rebecca Harkness' real life. And some things even directly conflict, but we should expect that. Why? Because the second reason. Taylor's album letter. When Taylor released Folklore, she released it with an album letter. This letter was supposed to give context and an overarching theme of the entire album. It was well chosen and it was meaningful. So if we're expecting that she may have hit Easter eggs in here telling us that the entire album is connected or what it's connected about, this is where they'd be. In the fourth paragraph, she says, a tale that becomes folklore is one that is passed down and whispered around, sometimes even sung about. The lines between fantasy and reality blur. And the boundaries between truth and fiction become almost indiscernible. Speculation over time becomes fact. Myths, ghost stories and fables, fairy tales and parables, gossip and legend, someone's secrets written in the sky for all to behold. She says she escaped into fantasy, history, and memory. So it's about her, it's about Rebecca Harkness, actual history, and it's about a completely imagined third thing. I believe that the way she said truth and fiction blur was an Easter egg for us to understand that even if she says something about Betty that doesn't relate to Rebecca Harkness, that it still connects because part of it is imagined. So basically the story that we know about Rebecca Harkness is a historical fan fiction, if you will. That horrifying realization is courtesy of a follower named Morgan. Thank you, Morgan, I hate it. So this means that Taylor Swift took what we know about Rebecca Harkness and imagined where she came from, what events and people shaped her into who she eventually became in her older years of fame. Taylor saw what others perceived as some crazy old woman and wondered, who made her like that? And she wrote about those possible events. I, why would she do that? Why would she write this whole album, the story of how her life weaves into and connects to this other woman's life whose house she owns, connected together with some invisible string of fate saying they're the same person? Why would she even write about that? Maybe she thought it, but why write it? Well, folks, it goes back to reputation. So right now, us Swifties and even the extended crowd, you know, the people who vaguely know Taylor, but they don't really keep up, which is 
most of the population at this point. Right now, we view Rebecca Harkness with like almost reverence. We listen to The Last Great American Dynasty and we marvel at her mystique. Her reckless, powerful, I don't care what anyone else thinks attitude, we admire it. She was messy, she had problems, she wasn't perfect, but we admire it. But before Taylor Swift wrote about her, she was near universally hated by everybody who knew her story. She was raised to be the sweet debutante girl with good breeding and a high social status. She was supposed to fold in and not cause problems. She was born rich, she was supposed to marry rich, she was supposed to die even richer. Essentially, she was meant to live a quiet life that elevated the status of her family. And instead, she attended those high society debutante coming out balls and she did strip teases on banquet tables and spiked punch bowls with lack Accidents. Nothing hardly ever goes to plan, does it? Worse than that, after she married William Hale Harkness, she became one of the richest women in the nation. Then, after her husband died, she took his incredible wealth that should have lasted for many generations and completely squandered it on her own ego. By funding her own ballet company, writing one terrible composition after another and being unable to improve. She spent money on gifts of people who didn't deserve it and who took advantage of her. She blew through the money on the boys in the ballet. Her neighborhood hated her for her antics. I mean, it was a neighborhood of old money and high society demure, and here was this old woman running around pacing the rocks in the middle of the night creepily like a ghost and dyeing people's animals green. Her parties ran late and they ran loud, so they annoyed everyone in town. People criticized her for being wasteful, for filling her pool with champagne and cleaning her pool with it. She had children and neglected them, they each became known for their own many scandals. Little did people know that the kids were in such distress they were probably acting out just to, as a cry for help. But no, how embarrassing of them for being in distress. Her reputation was so bad, she was called a terrible mother, insane financially just unspeakably irresponsible. Reckless with her reputation, with her love life, with her many marriages. She was considered a man-eater. If any man dared to even be near her, he was warned. And then, when her husband of seven years died, rumors went around that she did it. Can you imagine the emotional toll that takes on a person? I don't even have proper reading glasses, so these are blue light blocking glasses. How was Rebecca Harkness perceived before Taylor Swift got involved by writing about her? Let's do some research. Follow along with me on this fun and exciting exercise. So I'm gonna go to Google. I'm gonna search Rebecca Harkness. What comes up? The reviews are mixed, but it's mostly positive. Beautiful pictures of her when she was young. Vogue, the outrageous life of Rebecca Harkness. Talking about how she's a philanthropist, a patron of dance and medicine, and an artist. Her accomplishments. Veranda, meet the socialites that inspired Taylor Swift's The Last Great American Dynasty. Tadler, the fascinating story of Rebecca Harkness. It's really mostly good things. Or if not good, then at least intrigued. She was a shiny and fascinating woman. She's mostly perceived through a feminist lens of how she completely disregarded stereotypes, how she carved her own path. Cute. Fun. Now let's revise the search. By putting a minus symbol before any word in your search term, you can remove it from any of the results. So if we want to know what was written about Rebecca Harkness before Taylor Swift got involved, we can just remove her from the narrative. Now I'm going to search Rebecca Harkness minus Taylor minus Swift and see what comes up. Less cute. Chicago Tribune in 1988. A life of flamboyant desperation. Notably, we find an entry from Publishers Weekly. They have a bio of her own biography. And it's entitled Blue Blood, how Rebecca Harkness, one of the richest women in the world, destroyed a great American family. Let's go for a little read through the bio, shall we? What kind of picture does this paint? It says the author shows us the troubled life of Rebecca Harkness, a widow to Standard Oil heir William Hale Harkness. It says her eccentricities were often reported in the New York tabloids in the 60s and 70s. She dyed a cat green and scrubbed her pool with Dom Perignon. Her reckless, misdirected energy and enormous wealth were poured into the pursuit of a dance career. Misguided love affairs. I have to censor it here, but let's say substances and uh, spicy beverages. We're given intimate views of her lifestyle and the lives of her neglected three children, products of four marriages, chiefly through interviews with discarded friends and lovers and others who helped Rebecca dissipate a fortune. This is so mean. <laughs> this saga of the disintegration of a self-destructive family is studded with violence and mental degeneration. This was the common opinion of Rebecca Harkness. This is what people thought about her. This is scathing. So Rebecca Harkness was basically ye old cancelled. Similar things were said about Taylor back in the day. She was photographed near men. The men were warned. Every single article was kind of like Taylor Swift standing near 
some guy. Watch out, guy. <laughs> she was criticized for her wealth, for everything she said. Her creative endeavors were torn to shreds, both in the media, by critics, and in private conversations all around the world. She was considered a snake, two-faced, loud, annoying, whiny, insane. So Taylor saw the reputation of this woman, and she knew better. The town called Rebecca crazy, but Taylor wondered who made her like that. Taylor had been canceled before, so she knew. She rose up from the dead, a phoenix always rising from the ashes. So as she flipped through books, articles, magazines about Rebecca Harkness, she began to realize Rebecca was terrifyingly just like her and was rejected by society just like her. It's the pattern of these shiny people that we like to watch break, and it repeats over and over. It seems that Taylor decided that although she had survived, that wasn't enough. So she wrote Folklore, and in it, she set out to save Rebecca's reputation. So she looked into her life, and she used it as a jumping off point of sorts. She started to imagine, where did this broken woman get broken? What events shaped her? What hurt her to make her this way? She settled that it started in her childhood, her teenagerhood, and her young adulthood, but that's not where it ended. She continued telling stories, and eventually it built out to create this entire life story of this person, partly real and partly imagined. It came together to form a life story. Not exactly Rebecca Harkness' life story, but a life story. And it satisfied her curiosity. Now think of the lyric, Karma brings all my friends to the summit. The summit is proverbially fame and good positive perception. Whoever Taylor chooses to spotlight has an instant chance at fame and a positive following. This time, Taylor chose Rebecca. Because now, if you Google Rebecca Harkness, it is much more positive. Taylor saved Rebecca Harkness' reputation like she resuscitated her own. And that's why she wrote Folklore. But how did Taylor leave breadcrumbs through this album connecting all the tracks together? And how does the plot fit together? What interesting references can we pick out? Subscribe to be here for the next Folklore Analysis, which is a deep dive on whether every single song connects, and if they do, are the connections strong enough that we could confidently say that they all tell one story? It's gonna get real. Please like and share, because doing so makes you hotter, probably. And also, it costs you nothing, so really, what's there to lose? And go introduce yourselves in the comments. Go get to know each other down there. It's a fun little party. Can you tell me how you discovered Taylor Swift. If you want to learn more about this topic or see more from me, you should click on this video right here. That that thumbnail and title looks so cool and interesting, right? You probably want to click it. I know I would. Hey, give, give, give it a click. It would be so awesome. It would be so cool.